Teardown time. This is a uh, 4017. Uh, obviously a pretty old part here. We see a date code of 1983, uh, September. So uh, almost 40 years old. It's a uh, building block component. It's known as a modulo counter. In fact, it's a uh, modulo 10 counter. So it has 10 outputs. And uh, one of my viewers on my YouTube channel contacted me and said, why is the pinout of this part so weird? And to sort that down, first of all, take, let's take a look at the actual package. 16 pin dip, so quite quite obsolete. Uh, although, having said that, you can still buy this to this day. I checked on DigiKey this morning and it's still available. So uh, this is the part that's almost been in continuous production for 50 years. Uh, pin zero, uh, pardon me, pin three has the zeroth output. And then next to it's pin one, so that seems okay. Then two's down here, which is a little bit weird. Then pin three there, it's very weird. And, and you can sort of see it almost like almost looks random in terms of its uh, pinout. Uh, let's uh, sort this one down. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take off the package and sort down what the integrated circuit is. Okay, uh, before we de-encapsulate the part, uh, let's just take a look at uh, what the 4017 is useful for and how it operates. I wired up a simple 4017 here. And each of the decade outputs, I have a current limiting resistor and an LED. So basically, we're monitoring all 10 outputs of the decade counter. Over here, a switch, a resistor, and a capacitor. This forms a debouncing circuit. So every time I press the switch, it sends a nice clean edge into the counter. And of course, you can see what happens every time I press it, the LED moves downwards. And in fact, actually, if you replace this switch here with a, a slow speed oscillator, what you get is a very satisfying light chasing pattern. In fact, um, You'll see that actually it's a nice little um, circuit to uh, whip up if you uh, want a nice little novelty uh, design. In terms of more industrial applications, uh, this kind of circuit here is very helpful for selecting various inputs. Um, for example, you can imagine if you've had something like an audio mixer board, you could use the outputs of this decade counter to select various inputs and then every time the user presses a button on the front, it could be used as a control signal to, to uh, say, move a different signal into a circuit. Okay, so uh, I've de-encapsulated the part and what we're looking at is a silicon die. Uh, you can quickly verify we're looking at the right one because the designers put on the metal layer the uh, numbers 4017, uh, which of course matches the part number of the product we're looking at. The uh, bond pads look purple. Uh, that's just an uh, artifact of diffraction. They're not purple. They uh, just the uh, way the light hit them. Uh, and of course associated with every bond pad is a bond wire. And uh, it, of course very thick gold uh, le looking leads. Uh, this is a fairly old integrated circuit in that era. The uh, gold was pretty thick. As you can imagine, over time, the industry tried to go for thinner and thinner bond wires when they made it with gold. Uh, and then eventually, uh, some circuits now use uh, copper for uh, obvious cost reasons. Um, in fact, the, there's so much gold in these old integrated circuits, it's actually profitable to uh, crush them up to recover the gold. However, uh, that's not the purpose of uh, this video. Uh, let's see. To sort down, of course, what we're looking at, uh, the uh, blue area is uh, silicon. And the silver area is uh, basically conductors, uh, metal. And uh, in fact, this is such an old process with a node, I think we're looking at a single metal layout, which actually would explain a lot about why the layout of, of the outputs are so um, unusual. So to sort down what we're looking at, uh, we really need a schematic. And uh, in the IS era of integrated circuit design, we're very fortunate because um, schematics are readily available. Uh, let's see. You can see there's an area in here, there's five flip-flops in a row, and those will be fairly regular structures and they'll be fairly significant. So let's see if we can find where the flip-flops are on the design because that'll help orientate our, our cells. Um, to do that, we're gonna go to what's known as the diffusion layer. So what's happened is I've uh, taken the metal off the chip, I stripped it off with uh, acid, and uh, now we're looking at basically the silicon. Uh, let's just uh, zoom into some of these rectangles though, so we can understand better what we're looking at. Uh, let's see, um, there's a good one there. Uh, so the silicon has what's called bulk here, um, but to create transistors, you have to have some of the silicon has to be N-doped for the uh, N-FETs, and some of it has to be P-doped for the P-FETs. Uh, and in order to do that, you basically create what's known as a diffusion well. And then uh, in the center, you can start diffusing these areas with, uh, with, with um, ions, and you can dope them with the, uh, the right uh, N or P. And from there, of course, you can start creating all the transistors. Let's uh, just zoom back out again and see uh, if we can for, uh, solve our first mission to find those uh, five flip-flops. And uh, first thing you notice is that in the center, there appears to be a fairly regular uh, area here that gets repeated. So there's one here, and there's one here, one here, one here, and one here. Uh, and of course, uh, that's uh, five flip-flops. They basically are put onto the center of the design. 
And of course that now leads us to the question of what else is going on in this particular die. These flip-flops, obviously the outputs have to go somewhere. They've got to get out, uh, then they have to go through some logic to uh, get to the bond pads. So here we see the die, and now the uh, bond pads have been annotated, and we can start to see some of the uh, funniness in terms of the uh, numbering. For example, here is the fifth output, and here is the first output, and of course, why are they next to each other? Uh, to sort that down, actually, let's go back to the schematic, because that's all going to become very apparent very quickly. Let's uh, look at uh, those outputs of 1 and 5 and uh, trace back the uh, common signals. So here's output 1, and here's output 5. And of course you can see this is an inverter, and this is a NAND gate. So actually this is just, of course, an AND gate. Uh, this particular input, though, the NAND comes down here and goes to looks like the positive output of the first flip-flop. And of course we trace across down here. Uh, no surprise, all of a sudden comes up to the fifth. So these 1 and 5 actually, although... They're not uh, tied together in terms of their sequence. They are definitely tied together logically. And the designer basically has to put all of these gates here somewhere on the, the, on the design. Let's see if we can figure out where they went. So we're back to the diffusion layer. Uh, here is one, um, and here is five, or is it that way around? Oh, no matter. They're, they're both here. And then of course here, hey, cool. There's an area basically where you could construct uh, a gate. So let's just zoom in again. This is what's... Uh, those are diffusion wells that we were talking about it in a moment ago. Basically, they're doped areas. And in here, of course, you can get crossings where you can create FETs, and then, of course, you can create some logic. So that's good. Let's see if we can uh, find other areas where there's uh, things tied together to see if uh, this theory holds a bit of water. Uh, there's uh, another one of these structures up here. So there's another pad here, another pad here, and it looks like an area for logic here. Let's just go to the pinout. So here's the pinout section, and uh, so let's see, same thing. Looks like it's 4 and 8. Let's see if there's any 4 and 8. Let's see if they share any um, common inputs. So as before, here's 4, here's 8, um, and of course, uh, same deal. As you might imagine, of course, they're actually tied together here. As you can see, these two actually share the same gate. So basically, to, to lay down these two um, AND gates, uh, the designer put them on the periphery of the chip. And uh, then they wired them together. And of course, you ask yourself, why did he do that? Um, it's mostly because uh, it's only a single metal layer for the routing. So there actually isn't a lot of uh, possibilities in terms of routing. Let's go back to the metal here. Here's the metal. Uh, and of course, you can see, um, just like a circuit board, actually, all the traces running around here. And of course, you see the traces running here. And basically, and they're right here, and of course, they're going out to these gates here. And because he doesn't want a lot of crossovers, he ends up having to put uh, the gates together in what looks like a pretty non-logical manner. Okay, cool. Uh, that leaves only one area left on the chip, and that's uh, the area on the upper left here. Uh, there's a bunch of areas, there's also some logic there. What the heck that's about? Let's again go back to the schematic, it becomes quickly apparent. Here we are back to the schematic, and we can see that... Um, in the lower portion of the chip, there's some reset faculties and some clock inputs. So it looks like you can put in a normal clock with a Schmidt trigger and then uh, invert here, perhaps. So, of course, two, four, six, eight gates. And, of course, we come back to the diffusion layer, we can see about eight gates worth of logic here. And um, those, of course, uh, provide what's required for the uh, integrated circuit. All right, well, there you go. Uh, so what's happening here with this design is basically with one metal layer. Uh, the designer was constrained, so he tried to put things together so he could create the routing as small as possible. And, of course, that resulted in a fairly uh, strange uh, pinout. As always, if you want to take a look more, I have the detailed photographs of this integrated circuit on my blog, electronupdate.blogspot.com.